So let's snag one more speedrun game. And of course, we will play the King's Gambit, or the Queen's Gambit. And here we go. So normally I play aggressively with white, but we've got a lot of questions about the Queen's Gambit. So that's exactly what I'm going to play. I'm going to play the Queen's Gambit, which is not a, a passive opening. So, okay. So this is the Queen's Gambit accepted. This is the Queen's Gambit accepted. And in the Queen's Gambit accepted, there are two fundamentally different ways of playing. There is a more solid type of approach that's connected to e3. Thank you, sexy card, gifting the tier three. <laughs> or there is a very aggressive continuation, which I advocate to uh, most of the people watching, which is, of course, e4. There is also a misconception that e4 is like the only move. e4 is not the only move. It is not even the main move, but it is considered, I think, the most testing move currently. Okay, so h6 is weird. I mean, he's just letting us take the pawn, and now we have a great position because every tempo matters here. Okay, so e6. And yeah, so he's playing passively. He's not playing terribly. And just like in any other opening, we just need to develop our pieces. There's nothing that, there's nothing particularly crazy that we have to do here. So what should we do? Yeah, just knight f3. I mean, knight c3, knight f3. It doesn't really matter. We'll start with knight c3. Because it's a little bit more flexible. Maybe we can get this knight to e2. Yes, yeah, so knight, he goes c5. And again, we should follow our instincts here. Taking on c5 is clearly not a good idea because it allows the queen trade. So the obvious move here, and I don't see a reason not to play it, is just to push d5, controlling more of the center, and creating a lot of tension. If he takes on d5, then we'll be able to establish a very nice knight on, an, on this outpost. Okay, let's play knight takes d5. And we've got a f phenomenal position here, obviously. We've got all these pieces. We've got a knight in the center. Uh, just give me give me one second, guys. Um, okay. Yeah, guys, give me one second. Okay, actually, let's make a move. My uh, routers, the, the extender's coming loose. Um, so what should we do here? Let's make the move and then I'll, I need like 10 seconds. What's the move here? What should we do? And this is a very instructive moment in my opinion because a lot of players look at this move and they say, well, he's created a tension between the knights. So we have to react to that. We have to take on F6. We have to do something about it. We have to go queen F3. But... That is a false assumption. Black is actually not threatening anything because he wants to take on d5, yes, but then we'll just replace the knight with a bishop, and the bishop on d5 is also good. Um, is he really threatening to take on e4? No, because we are outpacing him in development, and taking on e4 is catastrophic because that's going to open the e file, and we're going to put a rook on e1, and we're just going to checkmate him here. So we actually don't need to change our play at all. You guys are trying to play queen f3 in order to attack f7, but it's too early for that. And the reason it's too early for that is because he's going to take on d5 and then he's going to defend f7. And then it's going to be hard for us to develop this knight to a natural square. And I'll show this after the game in more detail. So actually, we're just going to develop as if nothing happened, because nothing did happen. I'll be right one second. All right, and he's committed a blunder. So he has committed a blunder. How do we see this? You should totally spot the standoff, 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 standoffs. Um, the queens are in a standoff. The king is defending the queen. And we can distract the king by playing the very classic move, bishop takes f7, check. Now, ideally, we would have to check that after king takes f7, queen takes d8, he doesn't have bishop before check. That is a common idea in response to this kind of tactic. I didn't actually do this because I saw that the bishop is blocked by its own pawn. So he blunders the queen, we take it, and we're going to win. Alternatively, yeah, the queen is a type 2 undefended piece, so it's susceptible to these kinds of tactics. And uh, thank you, Ellis, appreciate it. And thanks for your uh, support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, king, okay, so he resigns. Now, 
And we are over 1,200. Yeah, so this movie four um, is is not the only move. And the other main move, as I said, is, is E3. Now, the benefit of E3 over E4 is that this keeps the D4 pawn nicely protected. This keeps the center better protected. Um, on the flip side, it blocks this bishop on c1, which is a drawback, but it's not a huge one. And there's a, the other appeal of this move is that there is a, a trap that has existed for uh, over 400 years, which goes b5. Now you have a pawn chain. As you guys know, you should undermine the base of the pawn chain, a4. This pawn is undermined, but he can try to defend it with c6. If he tries to defend it with a6, then you're going to run into a hanging rook on a8. So black can try c6. But if he tries c6, then there's a b5, c b5. This diagonal is open, and queen f3 actually just wins a piece or the rook. This is actually a very funny position if you haven't seen this before, because it seems ludicrous that black cannot defend the rook, and yet he can't. So that has existed forever. Um, and we got a donation, and it's a $20 one from Shando Guardian. Thank you so much, man. The generosity today has not stopped. Thanks, man. I, I really, really appreciate it. Okay. So, yeah, so e3 is, is possible, and generally speaking, black gives up the pawn and goes e6 followed by c5, and it's a combative position. But we decided to play e4, which is far more testing, in uh, particularly at like the beginner intermediate level. Now h6 is is just bad, and he just shows that our opponent doesn't see the urgency in the situation. He just sort of plays kind of a move that covers the g5 score, but we didn't want to put anything on g5 anyway. And yeah, that's way too passive. And the sort of the, the natural move here is e5. That's the main line. That's the old main line. Nowadays, people have started to play other stuff as well, but e5 is still good. And it's a counter gambit, because if you take on e5, then black trades queens, exposing white's king, which has lost its castling rights. And remember, black uh, was up a pawn, so material is equal and white's king is weak. This is bad for white. And so instead, white has to play the move knight f3. Uh, black takes on d4, and white takes on c4. So white preserves the gambit spirit of this line, white is still down a pawn, but we've developed two pieces, black has developed zero, and we have pressure on f7, so I'll put it this way. This line equalizes for black if he's very, very precise, but most people who've not studied the theory are going to get absolutely destroyed here with black, because black has to be so, so precise here, because he's got no develop. And that is why, to repeat something I said earlier, I'm sorry to belabor the point here, but when people look at what Magnus plays or what Aronian plays, and they try to model their repertoire on those people, you often get very poor results because those people are able to violate the rules. Thank you, kind of pink shake. And, to, and, and they're able to do so because they spend weeks and weeks and months and years studying these lines. And for people who have less time to devote to chess, you want to choose lines where even if you forget the move order, if you forget your theory, you're not going to get swept off the board. All right. Um, so some people are asking what happens if d5. Well, d5 is possible, but it's not particularly dangerous because it closes up the center and black can simply go knight f6. And, uh, you know, black is fine. He can go bishop d6 and castle. It's a comfortable position. Um, okay. Okay. So knight f3 is the move here, but our opponent played h6. That's very passive. We take on c4, c6, knight c3, c5, d5 pushing. This is all very natural. Knight f3 is the only, I think, in instructive position in this game. Um, a lot of you guys wanted to play queen f3, and I, I understand, as I said, I understand the impulse to play queen f3. Two bucks from Arch Assassin, but... After knight d5, bishop d5, you're basically playing for a one-move threat. That's the problem here. And this one-move threat is quite easy to parry. This is not bad for white. This is actually, white is still much better. But I would be a little bit concerned here, even a move like queen f6, 
could be quite annoying. Even a move like queen f6 could be quite annoying. Because although the endgame is much better for white, you've ruined black's pawn structure. I'm not sure that this is the most that white can squeeze from this line, if that makes sense. Which is why knight f3, I think, preserves the tension and gives white a better chance to win the game fast. If knight e4, what do you guys think white does? What is the simplest, the most zen move here? What is the move in the spirit of knight f3? It is to castle. Good job. It is to castle. Because we want a rook on e1. Putting the queen on e2, and I know this is on some people's mind, is not as effective because of f5 defending the knight. We don't want our queen to be on the e-file. We want our queen to be on the d-file staring off at the other queen. The rook is the piece that belongs on e1. And as they say in Russian, black, black will not even collect his bones. I mean, this is going to be a massacre. So knight c6, rook e1. And see, the difference here is that the queen is free. You've not saddled the queen with the task of pinning the knight. So now the queen can go to h5 after this knight moves, or you could play the even simpler move, bishop f4, trying to go for knight c7. And everybody should see how much of a disaster this is for black. Everything is falling apart, and we couldn't care less about the extra pawn. So uh, does queen d3 work for supporting the center? At, at, at which point? At this point? Well, again, I mean, it's, it's not a bad move per se, but we don't need to play it. The point is we can not only afford to sacrifice this pawn, but this is barely even a sac. I wouldn't even call this a sacrifice because it's so overwhelming that taking on e4 is just unthinkable. All right. Uh, did I anticipate that he could blunder his queen? I mean, I saw this concept, but I didn't think this would happen. And of course he should have played king e7, prolonging the game. What should we have done here? What should we have done here? This is um, this is a, an instructive moment because what you have to realize is that you don't want to trade queens here. Trading queens would prolong the game, although it's fine. And so if you ask yourself, how can I avoid the trade of queens while not blundering the bishop, you come up with a very simple move, bishop back to d5 or queen b3, but I like bishop d5. Why keep the bishop on a vulnerable square? Then you have many ideas like this, then you can castle. And black is, I mean, look at this king. Black is completely busted. You're just going to continue your development and win easily. So that's basically that. I mean, once he takes, the game is over. Yeah. Um, bishop f7, king e7, bishop d5. Then the immediate threat is to play knight e5, but that's not obligatory. Okay. Um, if you did knight f3 before knight c3, can you still take his d pawn? Well, I assume you mean, can you still play d5 here? And the answer is yes. You can play bishop takes d5, that's fine. And if knight f6, then you still have this, this idea. So the answer is yes. Um, yeah, so any questions about this game? Okay, looks like we're all pretty much clear. Okay, let's go. And we have black against Pierre Tichago. Let's do another Karakhan. That's what we've been playing. That's what we'll continue to play. And he goes e5. So e5 is a weird move. It's not a horrible move. It's actually better than people make it out to be. And obviously this pawn is quite annoying, actually. It's quite annoying because it doesn't allow us to develop our knight to f6. So what should we do here to deal with this pawn? How should we deal with it? I have a feeling that some people are thinking of moving the queen out. But remember the rule, queens are not particularly good at picking off pawns like this, and this pawn can be very easily protected with d4. So first we should play d6 to simply undermine this pawn. Okay, so he's taken, and the position is equal. I mean, if he plays d4, he's not worse, but he's given us a check instead. That's already a bad move. See, at this level, if you simply follow the rules, your opponents are, are, he's going to do something like queen e2, which is in clear violation of opening rules. I mean, he's blocking the development of his own bishop. We've seen this move a million times. Now, how should we block this check? Because we have this move, we have this move, we have 97. Well, 97 we can rule out, because why block the development of the bishop? And to figure out whether we should play here or here, we should understand 
how we want to develop um, and what we want to develop first. Well, our immediate priority, noticing the queen and the king, is going to be to put a rook on e8, right? That will create potential to pin him. To put a rook on e8, the fastest way of doing that is to castle short. And to castle short, we need to clear the king side. So bishop e7 is the move. Knight f6. Now, we're probably not going to get a chance to win his queen here if he plays this carefully. But he is not playing this carefully. Do we need to play h6 or should we castle immediately? This is another instructive moment. We don't need to play h6. There's absolutely no reason. And I love that people are actually seeing this. I feel like that's some growth. This knight is doing absolutely nothing. There's no reason to be intimidated by it. He's the sort of guy who's going to play queen d3 here and think that he's intimidating us by attacking on h7, but he's not. Because queen d3 doesn't even threaten anything. But I have a feeling that he's going to do something like this or something like h4. Okay, knight c3. Now we obviously should go rook e8. And now he's in big trouble because now we are threatening simply to move the bishop back to f8 and at the very least to win a knight that might appear on e4. So beware these fake threats. And how do you know threats are fake? Well, go from first principles. He's got no pieces developed other than one single knight. That's not going to cut it. That's not something that you need to worry about. So what's the move here? Yeah, bishop f8 is correct. And uh, knight e4, knight takes e4, of course. And obviously, pawn to d5. I'm not even asking you guys to find these moves. These are very, very straightforward moves. And white is busted. I mean, he's got to go here and then castle, and but he's just down a knight. Okay, queen d3 is even worse. Now, on the difference between simplifying versus keeping pieces on the board, this is a great example of when I think some people might propose d takes e4 to encourage the queen trade, and that would be a legitimate decision. But in a situation like this, it is very, very clear that his king is in massive trouble. So there's no point in forcing the simplification when you can just go ahead and checkmate him, basically, right? So you want to use your judgment when it comes to deciding between simplifying and keeping pieces on the board. There's no algorithm to follow. You just have to make a judgment call. Okay, so bishop e2. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking about this move, but be very, very careful. Bishops can be blocked with pawns. Bishop g4 is bad on account of f3. So instead, we should focus on preventing him from castling. There are several good ways of doing that. Um, but the move that just sticks a fork in it is bishop h3. We could have also moved our queen to the side, uh, pressuring the bishop. Okay, so f3, we should bring our rook back. Yeah, so this sticks a fork in it because he's never going to be able to castle past this bishop. And if he tries to bring his king to f2, which he might, goes bishop c... Okay, rook We can still go bishop c5, developing with tempo. Thank you, sexy card, to Adrian28, another tier 3. This man is unstoppable. Okay, rook back to h1. Now, let's be patient. Some of you guys might notice this rook and say bishop g2 is winning. It is, but... This bishop is worth its weight in gold. I want to keep it on h3 because it keeps his position paralyzed. Now, when your opponent's position is paralyzed like this, at some point, you have to demonstrate the patience necessary to bring more pieces into the game. All we need is maybe like one more rook into the game. So we all we need to do is play a move like knight d7, and that is going to greatly ease our task because it's going to give us more pieces to work with. This knight can go out to e5. There's a million ways to win this position. But, yeah, so knight e5 is good. Um, there's a million times that, there's a million ways to win this position. I, I also like queen b6 or queen e7. Yeah, queen e7 is a good move. Just piling up on this bishop. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, everything is winning here. Don't overthink this. This is just, okay, so this is the fastest. Yeah. And that's how you punish a move like Windy 2. You just can't get away with this kind of stuff. All right. And, and there's nothing I did here that was in, in, in the least way creative or, um, you know, or, or 
or, or, or had the GM title as a prerequisite. So, <laughs> you know, I hope that is clear. A thousand bits, thank you. Danny Duncan's website, you say. And what does that website show? <laughs> okay. So, queen e2 check is very, very bad. Obviously, he should have played d4. And we would have played d5. And this basically leads to like a very symmetrical, very boring position. And it's the, the boring position is equal, and you have to be capable of playing such positions. All right. Yeah, so I know it seems like, like, why don't my opponents do that? That's a, I get that that happens. And uh, that's, it's a frustrating thing, but it will happen. Knight f3, knight f6, castles, knight g5. We j literally did everything by the book. We put a rook on e8. We won his knight. We stopped him from castling. Then we patiently brought a piece into the game. We pinned him even further, and we delivered checkmate on the first attempt. Okay, so literally very, very simple play. All right, one more. I'm feeling it, guys. It's not even 2 a.m. yet. One more. Um, and Sandy Malan Purwanda. Okay, so let's do another Queen's Gambit then. Since we're in a Queen's Gambit kind of mood. Okay, so he goes e6. Now, this gives us a choice. And... Hmm. Obviously, another thousand bits sexy card. What is he crazy? The choice is between playing e4, transposing into the French, and playing c4 and keeping the spirit of a 1d4. But let's go e4 and transpose into a French because I feel like he might have not intended that. Thank you, CJ Storm, for the tier two. Now, yes. Now, one of the things that I wanted to tackle in this speedrun is the question of how to play in closed positions because that is a very daunting topic for a lot of players and it's not an easy topic to talk about but let's play the advanced French which is the OG closed position okay knight c6 is already a mistake knight c6 is already a mistake conceptually though it's a positional mistake because as we know this creates a pawn chain Pawn chains need to be attacked, particularly ones that give you a space advantage. So that's where the move c5 comes from. By playing knight c6, he's committing well, he's committing a similar mistake to to this guy when when he played knight c3, right? Which is a different type of mistake. He's weakening the pawn here. Here he's blocking the c pawn, which is important for another reason. It's not to defend his pawn; it's to attack my pawn. Now we can just develop unimpeded. We can go knight f3, and we've got a great position. Okay, so f6 is fine. He attacks the base of the pawn chain rather than, sorry, the tip of the pawn chain rather than the base, which is not a horrible idea, but definitely not as good as playing c5. So the same principle applies here as in two games ago, we had this position, right? He played knight f6. And I feel like there's a tendency here to panic and to assume, ah, you know, I have to do something about these threats. It's the same kind of mentality here. We need to figure out whether he's actually threatening anything. So, hey, and, and, and the answer to that, if you actually ask yourself that question, and it's not a rhetorical question, is, is no. Because this pawn is protected twice and it's attacked twice, which means we don't need to do anything with it. We don't even need to protect it. As a matter of fact, if he takes on e5, he's going to make even more weaknesses on his king side, and that's going to help us. Five bucks from Jetta. Thank you. I'll answer that after the game. So what should we do in this position? That was a long-winded explanation. What should we do in this, in this position? We should just develop as if nothing had happened. What should we develop here? Well, this bishop seems like a good piece to develop. We can pin the knight. But I would prefer for this bishop to participate in a potential attack against this king. So what am I saying here? Yeah, bishop d3. I'll talk about why pinning the knight is not such a good idea after the game. It's not a terrible idea. But he would have just played bishop d7 and unpinned the knight. And then our bishop would have been essentially unemployed. And also susceptible to a certain tactic. Okay. 
but why not five? Yeah, so he takes, and so do we. And now look at his king. And look at, the, you know, there's no pawn here. We've got these kinds of moves. We've got these kinds of ideas. But before we apply any of them, let's patiently castle to make sure that our king doesn't cause us any problems. And, you know, I know that these positions are mysterious to a lot of people. I won't be able to explain everything, but hopefully I'm demystifying certain things. Okay. Come fly down here to Miami. I'd, I'd love to sexy call. When I'm in Charlotte, I'm pretty close. Thousand bits. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what should we do? Now, there's a couple of ways to approach this position. Bishop g5 is a very tempting developing move, but it doesn't do as much as I think some people realize because he just moves his queen over to f7. And that bishop is sort of staring into thin air, right? And it's actually kind of helping him get his knight out to e7. I hope that makes sense. The fact that his queen is on e7 is a blessing for us because it's blocking the knight from coming out to any kind of civilized square. So what I'm getting at here is that we actually have the potential to start attacking him. But in order to start attacking him, it would be a good idea to open up the center. So what move am I hinting at here? And he's disconnected here, unfortunately. Okay, reconnected. Boom. I think c4 is the classy move. So he's got all these structural weaknesses in his position. And when I see these words like structural weaknesses or development advantage, you should be associating that with opening up the center. By opening up the center, you're going to ease, um, you're going to uh, make it easier for yourself to, uh, to not only attack as king, but to access all of these weak squares. This is a great example of this. Now, the move d4, um, what is the drawback of this move? It weakens the e4 square. What do we want on e4? This is a great maneuver. But before we do that, let's go a3 threatening to trap his bishop with b4 and c5. This also covers the b4 square so that he won't have any knight before shenanigans. I noticed somebody said that. Yeah, let's cover that square. His best move would be a5. And then we're going to swing this knight around to this beautiful and juicy central square. I mean, I hope my play makes sense. Um, okay, he doesn't prevent... See, and this is the good thing about playing like this. It's like we circumvent the need to even play positionally. We just win his piece. Yeah, this is basically winning. So, takes, takes, and we're up a piece. Okay, now, there's no need for us to give this bishop away. We, we can, and, and, and there's many things that we can do in a position like this, many, many things. We can simply take his pawn, but some of you guys are noticing the relationship between the queen and the knight. They're on the same diagonal. We have a dark squared bishop. Why don't we put it on a3? and create even further tension in his position, so c5. Now, let's simplify the position. What does that mean? What is the best way to simplify? And thank you guys. And while we're simplifying, we can also snag another pawn. Yeah, so let's take the knight, and obviously we can hit this pawn while we're at it, because why not? We can vacuum this guy up. This also paves the way for a queen h5 check in the future, so it's conducive to our attacking plans. In fact, he's just walked right into that move. So let's play it. Queen h5 check. Why not? Thank you, the judge. See, now what should we do here? If you've been doing your puzzle rush, this move should come at the snap of a finger. There's free stuff absolutely everywhere. Boom. This is like as classic of an idea as it gets. Bishop takes g6. Check. And if he takes, he drops not only the rook, but that comes with another pin. So if he takes our knight, we take his and then we're gonna pick off that rook in the end. And that's probably, he should castle here, but that doesn't really help. He does. Now we're up a rook. And first thing we should, we should, we should orient ourselves for a second. We should, we should figure out what's going on. Well, what's going on is that our knight is hanging. Some of you guys might be a little concerned about this little thing over here. But if you break that down for a second, is he actually threatening any kind of discovered attack against the queen? You should be concerned about it. You should be obsessed with the health and safety of your queen. You should make sure it's vaccinated first. But is he actually threatening any kind of dangerous discovery? No. 
If he plays knight e7, we just move the queen. We have plenty of squares. So we don't even need to move this queen from h8 because it's actually doing a great job of protecting the e5 pawn. What we need to move is this knight on d4. Where should we move it? Well, we've got a lot of good squares. We can move it to b5 and uh, try to get it to d6, but then he can take it. But where else can we move it? What would be the classy square? The classy square would be where? So not knight f3, but knight b3, attacking the queen. Play with tempo when you can. And bonus points if you saw queen take c4, boom, boom, rook c1, the knight defends that square. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, well, how, should, how am I supposed to see this? Well, that's where solving puzzles and tactical awareness comes in. I can't tell you a formula for seeing everything. There are some things that you just sort of have to instinctually see. And that means that's something which can be developed through solving and through reading. Okay, so c5 is a good move, but we don't need to play it. Instead of c5, think of the three bucks. What should we do? What else can we suggest? What other ideas do you guys have? There's something we haven't completed yet. There's something we haven't completed yet. And that is our development. And until we complete our development, I don't even want to think about these moves. Yes, 92. Have the restraint to complete your development in these kinds of positions. It's going to make your job a lot easier. Thank you for the 1,000 bit sexy car. Well, why did you send me a DM, sexy car? We'll, we'll coordinate. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out for sure. Thank you, uh, TomPhil94. And uh, Regal for the prime. I wouldn't rule it out. Sexy car. Tom Phil, another thousand bits from the Dark Knight Rises. Thank you, sir. Why not move the effort to protect the knight? I'll, I'll explain it. Fantastic question. Let me write this down. Dark Knight's question. Well, on the topic of your question, um, we can now play rook f to d1 and create the tension against the uh, against the bishop. Okay, now we can bring the queen back because he was he was attacking it, and now we just converge on him. And in general, attacking with pieces is going to be a little bit more intuitive and safer than attacking with pawns. So here I can tell that a lot of you are thinking about c5, but Let's say that I forced you to play with pieces rather than play with pawns. What would you do? Eric, thank you for the sub. Well, rook a5 blunders the rook, but good thought. That's okay. Okay, so you guys are trying to play with the rooks, but knights are the pieces that act like screwdrivers. When there's a lot of these weak squares, great move, rook d6. I love that. I love that move. I'm going to play rook d6. I was thinking knight c5. But I love the move rook d6 because it pins his knight... And it prepares the double rooks, and then you're going to play knight bc5 after all of that is complete. And that is going to be absolutely crushing. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this game, so I hope I'm not being obnoxious. There's a lot to capture here. Now, all of these moves people are suggesting are fine. It's not that I'm claiming this is the best move. I think this is one of the possible wins, one of the many possible wins in the position. Okay, we're going to double rooks. Now, notice how the fact that I completed my development is making all of this possible. And it's coming very effortlessly because we've got so many pieces available to attack. If we had gone head over heels before playing a move like knight d2, it would have been a lot harder to actually complete the attack so, so easily. Okay. All right. I'm not sick, I'm just uh, tired, and we're going to end after this game. Okay, this is over. I mean, look at his position, he's totally paralyzed. Okay, now we get the knight to c5, we can just ignore this, doesn't matter. Take d7. Yeah, so we have a couple of flashy wins, but how do we actually bring this to its conclusion? How do we actually bring this to its conclusion? So the easiest is to understand that the rook on d8 is a type 2 undefended piece. 
if this bishop were to disappear, then queen takes d8 would be crushing. So knight e6 is not the flashiest, but it is the fastest win. Yeah, this is winning. Thank you, Surfinit. Yeah, rook e6 is good, but rook e6 doesn't force black into anything. This actually forces black to, well, probably to resign. Queen d8 directly is not as clear. Now, queen d8 directly I actually didn't like. And, okay, so he goes there. We can just take this. We could have taken with the knight, doesn't matter. This is winning. Yeah, this is over. Over and done with. Two rooks up and we're mating him. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do the, I'll answer the questions after the game that will end, don't worry. I will, I, we had a great question from the Dark Knight Rises too, which I wanted to answer. Okay, good game. Thank you, Sandy Mulan Rwanda. Okay, so as I explained, um, C5 is the move. We won't delve into the theory today, but most of you guys already know that, uh, that, that C5 is a nice C6 is a conceptual mistake. Um, now, to understand why you need to attack the base of the pawn chain, you don't need to understand any chess. It's an architectural thing, I think, right? If you're playing Jenga, um, right, it's if you have to remove the base of the tower, it's far likelier that the whole foundation topples than if you're just to remove the top. Right, if you have a stack of books, and let's say those are a stack of the Bratsky books, and you know, if you have a stack of books and you remove the top book, the integrity of the structure remains alive. Obviously, I, you know, I'm belaboring the point here. With a pawn chain, it's quite the same thing. If you play c5 and white takes, then the pawn on e5 becomes weak, right? And the pawn on c5 becomes weak. Everything collapses. If black plays f6 and you take on f6, okay, you have a pawn trade, but the base of the pawn chain is not affected. Even if black plays f6 and takes, as he did in the game, this doesn't really affect the integrity of the chain, okay? So that's the bottom line here. Now, the problem when I say these things is people come back a week later and they say, well, Daniel, I heard you say this thing. I thought it was very wise. Uh, and guess what? My opponent attacked the base of the pawn chain and he won. Didn't you tell me that this is innocuous? You always have to, you have to take this with a grain of salt. There are plenty of situations when even the move F6 in the French is a great move. It's often a great move in the French, but that may be for another reason. For example, um, a reason why f6 might be good is to carve out the d6 square for the bishop, right? That could be a legitimate reason to play f6, but you're not actually trying to undermine the pawn chain here. So take this with a grain of salt, but very often it's more, uh, it's just powerful, more powerful to attack the base of the pawn chain. Okay, so bishop d3, right? Um, f takes e5, d takes e5. Another good reason to keep this pawn on e5 is to prevent him from developing the knight to f6, obviously. That's that's sort of self-evident from the placement of the pawn. Okay, so bishop c5, castles, queen e7. Now c4 to open the center. And here, it's less about attacking. So wait, here, we're attacking the base of the pawn chain, technically. Why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because it's not that we're trying to destroy the pawn chain itself. We're trying to carve out these light squares for the knight, particularly, and we're also trying to open up the center. So this move has less to do with attacking the pawn chain than with opening up the center. Yeah, this is a hard move to find. Yeah, this is the move that I think to a lot of people is not intuitive. Why is that? Um, I think the reason has to do with the fact that there exists a very tempting move, bishop g5, which, I, as I explained, is, in my opinion, a lot less powerful than it seems. Why? because it actually kind of helps black. By repositioning the queen to f7, black gains the e7 square for the knight. So this actually eases the develop, facilitates the development for black. And this bishop on g5, as you guys can see, it's, it's empty, it's not doing much. And also, to add insult to injury, imagine if black castles. You would love for a knight to be on g5, right? You would love for this kind of tactic to work. Now this bishop is blocking uh, that knight from coming to g5. So it's, actually quite a bad bishop. 
So that's like something that I see kind of intuitively, but hopefully mo more people see that now. Once you understand that, you begin to understand that you have a short window of opportunity in which black has not developed the king side, black hasn't developed the bishop, and in this short window of opportunity, you want to open up the position as much as possible because that is the typical prescription for exploiting uh, a lead in development. You want to open up the center, and that's how you find c4. Okay, that's one way of thinking about it. So d4, a3, threatening. Now, he should have played a5, of course, and then we would have gotten the knight to e4, and perhaps then we would have played bishop g5. That's a much better idea than before. Five bucks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, GM, no chance ever. And uh, the Dark Knight rises with a uh, sub. So after this, we win the piece. Now, we had a great question from the Dark Knight Rises, which I thought was an excellent, excellent question. And the question was, to paraphrase, why did you not play Rook D1? Because the Knight is already in a nice central square, right? Now, here's where I'm going to pull out the last sort of substantive piece of advice for today. When you're evaluating the placement of a piece, most people only consider one thing, and that is the placement of a piece relative to the board. The knight is in the center, so it's as good as it can be. What are the other two qualities that you have to factor in? The first is defendedness. So we have type one undefended pieces and type two undefended pieces, that's all I mean. If a piece is a type two or a type one undefended piece, it's going to be um, less effective most of the time than a piece which is defended. So if you repositioned this e pawn to e3, then this knight would have been a fully defended piece. But on d4, it's a type 2 undefended piece. It's defended by only one other piece. This immediately creates the possibility for what kind of a tactic. And you should see this tactic because you also notice that the rook on d1 is fully undefended. So what kind of unpleasant move might black have? And this move isn't that good here, but in general. What sort of move might black have? Deflection, right? So bishop c6, for example. Yeah, and then the, the knight is attacked. That's unpleasant. Yeah, bishop a4. Although here you can play rook takes a4. But I'm making a more general point here. The third thing that you have to factor in is roll. And what I mean by that is that a piece can be fully centralized. It can be smack dab in the middle of the board and it can be doing absolutely nothing now you could also have a piece on the side of the board and that piece is it seems like the worst piece in the world it's not protecting any squares or it's it, it's controlling like three squares and yet that is the most effective most powerful piece in the world you could have both scenarios because although controlling more squares increases the likelihood that a piece is going to be well placed. That does not in and of itself uh, determine whether a piece is well placed, if that makes sense. So you have to factor in all three things when you're evaluating piece placement. That's what makes that concept hard. If piece placement was only about where on the board a piece is placed, it would be very easy, but there's other things that must be factored in. And here, although the knight is in the center, it's undefended, and it's not really doing anything. One could argue that it's pressuring the pawn, but this pawn is well defended by the bishop. Sorry to belabor the point, but I just wanted to spit that one out. So knight b3, this knight is defended, it's hard to attack, and it can potentially go to c5. So it's got a much better uh, roll, and it actually wins us the game. That same knight is the, precisely the knight that wins us the game. So that knight goes to c5. So in order of importance, you should use uh, the centrality of pieces as a shortcut. Like if, if you're decentralizing a piece, if you're putting the knight on the rim, then that should raise your alarm bells, but you, sh you, you shouldn't not do it just because the knight is on the rim. If there's a good reason to put the knight on the rim, then that should supersede the fact that it's not controlling squares. And I will end with an example that I have hunted down just now that comes from an old chess.com article that I had. So here is a good example. Hopefully this will clarify things. Hopefully this will clarify things and then we will end. Okay. This applies to all pieces, but particularly to knights, of course. 
of course, particularly to knights. Yeah, that's that's really what I'm focusing on here. So we will end with this. Ribley against Larson. Now, you guys know who Larson is. Of course, Ribley, Hungarian Grandmaster. We've got a very closed position. And um, this may seem like a dead draw, but in fact, white is better. And the reason why it is better is because black's got all of these very weak squares in his position. And white can exploit those weak squares, but only if he plays very accurately. And in this position, what's up, man? White found a brilliant idea. And this idea involves a maneuver. What is he maneuvering into what square? Now, a lot of you guys are looking at this move, but black can simply go f6 and block the pin. Unfortunately, that is not effective. Thank you, Pats or Machine. What did white do in this position? Yeah, Min found it. So Ribley asks himself, well, what are the weak squares in black's position? And he identifies this square. Look at this amazing juicy square on b5. Well, what can we put on that square? Well, how about a knight? Well, how can we do it? Boom, knight a1, knight c2. Now, what Larson does is he brings his knight to c7 in order to control b5. And you get this insane and very interesting relationship between the knights where white's knight is holding all of the power because black's knight is tied down to the square. Even though black's knight is closer to the center, technically, white's knight is the one holding all of the power here because the moment the black's knight leaves c7, white's knight is gonna jump to b5 and eventually, eventually, it takes him a long time, long, long time, but eventually that knight, um, Oh, b5 becomes free and eventually 20 moves later the knight gets to b5 and uh this is precisely the knight that wins him the game because that knight comes into c7 it's a brilliant game and larson you uh, ribley uses that knight to win an exchange so this is a good example of a knight being on the rim and the knight having a very much full-fledged role on the rim so White's knight is not tied down. White's knight can leave anytime it wants to, and Black's knight will have no prospects. So I wrote an article several years back called Knights on the Rim are Amazing. I invite you to take a look at that one if you want more about this and you want this game annotated. But for now, I'm going to write an article called Daniel Nardisky is going to sleep because this has been a long stream. It's been an exhausting one, and it has been an amazing one. Thank you, The Dark Knight Rises, for a thousand bits.